Hey guys, it's Nick the Booksmith. Welcome back, welcome back. So I am going to be building, well, we'll see. I'm going to be building a miniature house. Let's be positive. Let's be positive. I'm going to be building a miniature house. And of course, this has taken some time, so we're just going to have to fast forward through this. But while you're watching me build this little house, I thought I'd tell you a story. It's a case that has um, always really tripped me up. It's one of those frustrating ones, and I think I always say that, right? Yeah. But yeah, this one, this one really gets me, and you may have heard of it before. This story is about a nine-year-old girl named Asia Degree. She was born in Shelby, North Carolina on August 5th of 1990. Psh, I was a grown-up. Well, I was sort of grown. <laughs> she lived with her parents, Harold and Aquila, and her older brother, O'Brien. He was 11 months-ish older than she was, so at this time he was 10. And they lived in a rented two-bedroom duplex just north of Shelby on Oak Crest Drive. And this is about an hour west of Charlotte, North Carolina. Her parents worked full time. Her dad worked on a loading dock and her mom actually worked in a piano factory. So that's kind of cool, right? The kids spent most of their time with their parents or other family members. I mean, they went to school and they went to church and that was about it. They didn't have a lot of contact with the outside world other than that. They didn't have a computer in their house and they didn't have cell phones or anything like that. In February of 2000, Aisha was nine years old. She was in the fourth grade and she played on a school basketball team, which she loved. She loved sports. On Friday, February 11th, her school was closed. I think it was like a, you know, like a teacher's work day where the kids don't have to go to school, but the teachers go in and they do like planning and stuff, like curriculum stuff. I, I don't know. The teachers, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, but her parents still had to go to work. So Aisha and her brother spent the day across the street at her auntie slash grandmother's house because I guess they lived together. And then after that, they went to basketball practice. The next day, there were some basketball games on Saturday the 12th that she and her brother were competing in. Unfortunately, Aisha ended up fouling out and her team did lose. And it kind of upset her because she felt like she let them down, which is normal. But it wasn't long before she got over it because she was joking around with her friends. The next day, which was Sunday, February 13th, Aisha and her brother went to church with their auntie and grandma. And then they went back to the auntie and grandma's house for lunch. Their grandmother, her name was Joanne, she gave them a bag of Valentine's candy before they went back home. Their mom put them to bed, um, stories say somewhere between 8 and 9 p.m. And because the house was only two bedroom, they shared a room. At about that time, from what I can tell, there was a car accident. So I don't know if a car hit an electric pole, like a telephone pole with electric lines on it, something like that. And the power did go out from like 9 o'clock to 1230. It's not really totally relevant from what I can gather, but it's just one of those out of the ordinary things that happened. So I thought I'd mention it. Now it's the early morning of February 14th and Aisha's father gets home from work. And when he got home, he would always go peek in the kid's bedroom to check on them. And he did, and they were both asleep in their beds. And then he had something to eat and was watching TV to wind down for the night. And he checked on them again about 2.30 on his way to bed. And everything seemed just fine. Aisha's brother heard her bed squeak in the early morning hours. And he didn't think much of it because why would you? You share a room with somebody and they're going to flip and flop and turn in bed. Or they're going to get up and go to the bathroom or get a drink or whatever. But at some point between... Their dad checking on them and 6.30 in the morning, Aisha grabbed her book bag that was already packed with some clothes and a Tweety Bird purse and walked out of the house. It was about 35 degrees and raining, but Aisha did not take any warm clothes with her. She didn't take a jacket. So let's pause here for a second. Kids run away. It's awful, but it happens. But what nine-year-old would wake up in the middle of the night and walk out of a warm house into a dark, rainy, cold night. 
Not many, I would think. A person that was believed to be Asia was spotted on two occasions sometime around 4 to 4 30 that morning. One of the witnesses was a truck driver and his name was Jeff Roop and he said he saw this person, this young person wearing a long sleeve t-shirt or night shirt and light colored pants and they were walking along Highway 18 just north of the intersection with Highway 180. After he passed this person, he was like, okay, this is weird. That's a little kid. They shouldn't be out by themselves. So he turns around to go check on them, which granted, I would have done the same thing. Now, I'm not going to be out driving at four o'clock in the morning because I just, I just don't do that. It just seems wrong. But if I was out driving and I saw a little kid, that is like the only thing I would stop for is an animal or a kid. If it's an adult, you're on your own. (laughs) But he said when he got close to the person that she ran off into the woods. The other sighting involved another motorist named Roy Blanton, who was with his son. The person he saw looked like a child in light-colored clothing, and he got on his CB radio and warned other truckers in the area to be careful because there was a young woman walking on the road or along the road. And this information wasn't immediately reported, but it would be reported in a few hours. At 6 o'clock that morning, or a little before, Aquila woke up. She usually got the kids up about 6.30 to get them ready for school, and she wanted them to take a bath because they hadn't taken one the night before. So she was running water for their bath, and she went to their room to wake them up, but only O'Brien was in there. Aisha's bed was messed up like it had been slept in, but Aisha wasn't in it. And I mean, she wasn't immediately like freaked out, but she searched the whole house. She even went and checked in the cars. And then she called across the street to the grandmother, and which was Harold's mom, the dad's mom and sister, the auntie, across the street. But they didn't see Aisha. They, they didn't have her either. So Aquila wakes up Harold and she goes and she calls her mom, who immediately tells her to hang up and dial 911. And that is when Harold does call 911 at 6.39 a.m. 6.41 p.m., the police rock up, which was super fast. And to their credit, they immediately start searching for Asia. Within only an hour, there are search dogs uh, sniffing around, seeing if they can get track on her scent. But they didn't detect anything past the mailbox. By noon, a helicopter and 60 volunteers were gathered to search. And it was about this time that Jeff Roop saw Aisha's story on the news, and he calls the police to report what he had seen earlier that morning. About a mile and a half south of Aisha's house, there is a family called the Turners who were searching their property because the law enforcement had asked all neighbors in the surrounding area to search their property. The Turners found a wallet-sized photo of a young girl along with just some trash in an unused chicken shed out in their property. They turned the photo into the police, but Asia's family and the school too, because they had the school look at the photo, nobody recognized the girl in the photo. And because of this, the Turners didn't hand over what they considered, you know, the trash that was just scattered in the shed, thinking that they were unrelated because the photo had nothing to do with Asia. So obviously this stuff didn't have anything to do with her either, but they kept it just in case they didn't throw it away, but they just didn't turn them in. During this time, the FBI was talking to Jeff Roop. He agreed to a polygraph test and after which they determined that he was being honest with them about when and where he reported seeing somebody that looked like Aisha run off into the woods. And the area along the highway where he indicated that she ran off the road became the new focus of the investigation. And this was near the Turner's property. One of the searchers that was um, doing an inch by inch search of the Turner property found a candy wrapper near the outbuilding where the photo was found. He showed this to the Turners and 
they were like, well, that looks just like the candy wrappers we found. And he's like, well, what candy wrappers did you find? So they went in there and they got the candy wrappers and there was a few things that they found in the shed with it. There was a, a bow like for hair, you know, a hair bow. And there was a pen and then there was a pencil that said Atlanta. They gave that to the searcher who immediately um, turned that into law enforcement. And when they showed Aisha's parents, they were like, yep, that is her candy wrappers. This is from the bag of candy that her grandmother had given her the day before. Uh, the pencil that said Atlanta, they had gotten that on a family reunion trip to Atlanta, Georgia. And that was her hair bow. It was all her stuff. But nothing else was found. That was it. And I, I didn't read anything about if they took the dogs over there to search. I, I would think they would. But regardless, nothing else was found about Asia or where she might have gone or footprints or anything. And six days later, the official search was over. Her classmates were interviewed, and I guess some of the classmates said that on Thursday, which was February the 10th, Aisha showed her friends some money in her purse. Now, her parents tell police that they aren't sure where the money came from. And I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, well, it's a nine-year-old. And so if it was like five bucks or less, because it is the year 2000. So, you know, we're talking almost a quarter of a century ago. I know, I know, I know. Take a deep breath. You know, even five bucks would have been pretty big to a nine-year-old. But that might have gone under the radar of her family. You know, she might have had that kind of money and nobody would have had any idea. But if it was more like 30, 40 bucks or something like that, even though, yeah, a nine-year-old kid could definitely have that, I would think at least like her brother or somebody would be like, yeah, she saved that up from presents or, you know, whatever. But the family didn't know where the money had come from. But I don't know why I'm going through all this because I don't know how much money was in her purse because it didn't say nothing. I looked. I looked. I couldn't find it. Then a year and a half later in 2001, and this is in August, there was a construction worker named Terry Fleming. And he was working off of Highway 18 about six miles south of Morganton, North Carolina, which is 26 miles north of where Asia was last seen. They were clearing land to build a driveway and he came across a book bag that was double wrapped in black plastic bags. The inside of the book bag had Aisha's name and phone number written in it. The book bag was turned over to the police, of course, but it wasn't until 2018, which is 17 years later, yep, 17 years later, they revealed that there were two items inside. There was a Dr. Seuss book that happened to be from the library at Asia's school and a New Kids on the Block t-shirt, but neither of those things belonged to Asia. In May of 2016, the FBI released a notice that Asia may have climbed into a vehicle along Highway 18 around the area where she was last seen running into the woods. According to tipsters, the vehicle was a green early 70s Lincoln Continental or Ford Thunderbird with rust around the wheel wells. And from what I could gather, there was two people in the car from what I could read. Maybe it wasn't just a one person in the car that there was possibly two people in the car. At the time of making this video, Asia remains missing. Now, I don't have to tell you that this case is extremely bizarre, very unusual. For one, nine-year-old girls rarely run away from home, especially since Aisha's personality and her behavior does not like jive with the kind of kid that would run away because everybody described her as lighthearted and funny and happy. She could be shy, but had lots of friends, got good grades, she did not go out of the house by herself. She wouldn't even answer the front door unless she knew who was there. Relatable, am I right? Uh, there wasn't any signs of forced entry into the house. So it really does appear as though Asia walked out into a rainstorm in the winter without wearing a coat. I have so many questions. Like, 
why weren't the police dogs able to pick up Aisha's scent? I mean, they're usually really good at that, even in the rain. Sometimes the rain is even helpful for scent. Then the items belonging to Aisha, the candy wrappers, the hair bow, the pen, the pencil, that were found in the outbuilding about a mile from her house. This building was 600 feet from the road, and to get there, Aisha would have had to walk uphill, the length of two football fields, and across a three-foot gully. But if Jeff Roop had scared her when he had turned his truck around to go check on her, would that have compelled her to run off the road and into the deep, dark, scary woods? I mean, maybe... You know, he was driving a semi-truck or a box truck at least. So, I mean, that's, especially to a nine-year-old kid, that's big. That could be scary. It's loud. It's a big dude and a big truck. And you're a nine-year-old little kid. And they're turning around to come and speak to you. And all you can think is stranger danger. I might have been compelled to run into the woods too. And then a year and a half later, when her book bag was found... Why was it wrapped in black plastic garbage bags? I mean, if somebody had done something to Aisha, wouldn't they have just thrown her things away? Unless they were afraid that the landfill would get searched. Um, Maybe they tossed the bag in the opposite direction from the location being searched and they intended on going back for it. Ah, And maybe they wrapped it in the plastic bags to keep it dry from the elements. I I don't know. What about the New Kids on the Block t-shirt? Who did that belong to? What about the Dr. Seuss book from her school's library? If she didn't check it out, who did? You'd think the library would keep records of who checks out books. I mean, that's like their one job, unless somebody took the book without checking it out. Authorities believe that she had packed the book bag with some clothes before the morning of February 14th as if she had planned to leave. But were they correct about that? The stuff in the book bag ended up not being hers. So do they know if she packed some clothes? I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they would, I mean, unless the parents said, well, this, this, and this is missing. And so they just assumed that that was in the book bag. I mean, maybe. In one version of the timeline, Aisha falls asleep on the couch before she got sent to bed. This makes it seem that maybe she was trying to stay awake or maybe she was going to fake falling asleep on the couch so that perhaps her mom would just not send her to bed and just let her sleep on the couch. I don't know. Did her mom do that very often? The next morning was school, but if she had fallen asleep on the couch, would her mom have just, you know, covered her up with a blanket and let her go to bed? Maybe, although she did send her to bed. And if Aisha had planned this in advance to get up, how would she wake up without using an alarm, although maybe she never fell asleep in the first place? Frustrating, right? This case bothers me more than I can say. If I try to put myself in Aisha's shoes, I... What would I have been thinking? Well, first, because she left the house at ugh, such an ungodly hour, I, I doubt she meant to be out in the dark and in the rain for very long. Now, I was a ballsy kid. I mean, like, ball Z. And there is no freaking way I'd go outside in the dark. Nuh-uh, no way. This right here makes me question if she even left the house willingly or at all. Unless being in the house was scarier than being outside the house for some reason. But I'm going to set that aside for now. Being devil's advocate, what are some other scenarios? Was she supposed to just walk a short distance and someone would pick her up? She had been to church earlier. Was there someone she trusted who like talked her into meeting them? If it was me at her age, I would have been more inclined to trust a woman than a man and a relative over a friend. Does that make any sense? Maybe it's different with you. Or 
did she make some plans to go with a friend maybe somewhere that she didn't think her parents would allow her to go so maybe she snuck out to go to this friend's house and in the rainy darkness got all turned around and lost her way this could explain the t-shirt and the book found in the bag maybe they belong to the friend at school I was thinking before or after the basketball game, I wonder if there's a locker room to change where she could have made plans with a classmate. Then either the friend didn't connect Aisha's disappearance with their plans they'd made, or the friend did connect it, but didn't say anything because they thought they'd get in trouble. On a more sinister note, instead of a classmate, could it have been a teacher, a student teacher, Um, a parent volunteer, a neighbor, or even a relative. I also read that she had recently gone to a slumber party, or at least was at her cousin's house who was having a slumber party. Was the bag packed from going over there? If so, why would she have grabbed it on the way out of her house? Unless she meant to give those items back to somebody? Or, I mean, were the items that were in the book bag placed there later by somebody else? I don't know. The fact that the dogs couldn't track her scent past the mailbox makes me wonder if she was either just going across the street to her grandma slash auntie's house, or maybe she went outside to talk to somebody or meet somebody just right outside the house. I just can't imagine a nine-year-old little kid One, going out in the dark because not many kids would do that. I don't care who you are. And two, if they thought they were going to be outside for more than 30 seconds, she would have taken a jacket. She did have shoes on, but I think she would have grabbed a jacket. And I hear you. Some of you are thinking it's got to be one or both of the parents. However, the items belonging to Aisha that were found in the chicken shed candy wrappers, the pen, the pencil, the hair bow, all that. That was found after she had been seen by the motorists. So would that eliminate the parents' involvement? Nobody saw anybody with Aisha. She was by herself. And how did she get out there? I mean, she had to leave after 2.30, but before, I mean, had to leave before (laughs) 4. So could a nine-year-old kid get a mile and a half in like an, like an hour and a half? I mean, I, I guess they could. There's such a short little window in there. Did somebody pick her up and why would they drop her off? Why would she walk that far? Do you know what I mean? Do you see how it's like all these questions? Because if somebody wanted to abduct her, why was she out walking along the highway? Would they abduct her and then go, oh, never mind, change my mind, and just drop her off along the highway? You know, Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? No, no, it doesn't make sense. If she was supposed to meet somebody, why didn't they just grab her? Because I can't imagine she'd leave the house without a purpose. Because if she had a purpose, she would have taken a jacket. She took the book bag, but not a jacket. So if she took the book bag with the shirt and the book in it, was it to return it to somebody? But she thought it was just going to take a second because she didn't take a coat. You guys, are you following me? Are you with me? Because some of the scenarios that have been put forward don't make any sense if you pick them apart. So anyway, as far as I read, neither the local police nor the FBI suspect the parents or her brother who was 10. So come on, he didn't do it. If he had done something, there would have been evidence. I'm, I don't think 10-year-olds are going to be really good at hiding stuff. The family is not suspected of having anything to do with Aisha's disappearance. But the case is still unsolved. So are we ever going to know? For me, the question isn't just what happened to Aisha after she walked out into that cold, rainy February night. But it's who or what could have convinced her to do so. But I want to know what you think. Let me know in the comment section because I'm really curious as to what would be going through your mind. Put yourself at nine years old. You know, what would you be doing? 
thanks so much for hanging out with me while I ramble about this case and try to make sense of some of it and fumble through building this miniature house. <laughs> the next video should be a continuation of the building, the painting, the roofing, all that jazz. But I hope you are having an excellent week. And I will see you really, really soon in the next video. Bye, guys.